Hello and welcome to my podcast, Up Your Total Glow, your podcast for your body, mind and soul to support, guide and empower you to uncover your most glowing, healthiest and feel-good version of you. I'm super excited that you're here because if you ask me, there's nothing that looks and feels better. In today's episode, I'm speaking with the absolutely amazing Kathleen Trotter. Kathleen is a fitness expert, personal trainer, life coach and author of Finding Your Fit. Kathleen has a very innovative and personal approach to fitness and health and she shares solutions for those for whom traditional approaches to a regular fitness routine haven't worked. She is totally committed to improving your overall well-being instead of just making sure that you hit this perfect number on the scale. In this very beautiful interview, Kathleen shares with us her own journey because she grew up overeating and also wasn't very fit at that time. She shares with us her unique approach, how you too can set yourself up in a very fail-proof way to save your present self from your future self. This interview is just rich in wisdom and it is your goal to uncover a healthier, fitter and more self-loving version of you then this interview is a must listen for you. Please enjoy. Hello and welcome, beautiful Kathleen. How are you? I'm really happy to be here. I think we're going to have an excellent conversation and I always love talking about health and wellness. Mm, so do I and I am also super excited to have you here and to get into this topic with the amazing you so maybe as a start could you just briefly introduce yourself absolutely um, I'll start sort of where I am now and then and you can see the juxtaposition of what I often will call my current Kathleen and my old Kathleen mm, so nice. yeah um, although Side note, my therapist always says, no, you don't call them two different Kathleen's because it's the same Kathleen and you wouldn't be the person you are now if you hadn't gone through all the ups and downs before. So I also appreciate oh, <laughs> that um, I'm grateful for all the hardship I had because I did really learn. Um, but it's helpful for me in my brain to think, okay, younger Kathleen would have thought with this mindset and that wasn't overly helpful. It didn't lead you to be, you know, your favorite version of Kathleen, whereas this version would think these ways. And this does lead you to feel better about yourself, more proud, full, you know, like proud of yourself. Um, so it, it's helpful in some ways. Anyway, I am currently a personal trainer, life coach and nutritionist. I live in Toronto and I work with clients to help them create their favorite version of themselves. And creation is a really important word for me because uh, health is an active process. Um, and I think so much of it is deciding the type of person you want to be and the integrity that you want to be able to live with and what your values are and finding ways to live those values. Um, but it's a really, really gradual um, and lifelong process. It's an infinite game. Um, and when I was growing up, I was not this version of Kathleen. I was not my favorite version of Kathleen. Um, I was, you know, my mom was a single mom. We moved around a lot. I'm six feet tall. I felt really awkward in my skin. Um, and I kind of really hated being Kathleen. I mean, in some ways, I, I, you know, I had a wonderful life. Like my mom is amazing. But I just would wake up every morning thinking, okay, you know, today is the day that I'm going to get active. Today is the day I'm going to eat better. Uh, and then every single day, like, you know, I was kind of lonely and I just felt, as I said, I felt awkward. My mom was a classical actress, so I knew a lot about like Shakespeare, but I didn't know anything about the TV that my, my, like my friends were watching and I just felt awkward. And so when I felt awkward, what did I do? I sort of ate and mostly in secret because my mom was very health conscious. And so at home, you know, we'd have apples and carrot sticks and all that stuff. And then I would time my route home from school so I could sneak food and, and then like have enough a mouthwash, you know, so my mom would never know um, and I would lie to get out of gym class and so and I say this story because I think it's important for people when they look at health professionals often they think oh well that person was born motivated and mm -hmm. so it's you know it's easy for them so why should I even try um, and I really try to encourage people to understand that 
I, I definitely was not born healthy or motivated or, you know, excited to wake up and go for a run. This was something that I cultivated, um, but it was a slow process. So what happened was eventually my mom said to me, listen, moving has to be a non-negotiable. And so far, all the ways that I've tried to get you to move, you know, like she put me in softball and ballet and all these things that were much more typical for my age and my gender, like my stage in life. And she said, these obviously have not been working. So we have to find your fit. And this was actually the inspiration for my first book. Like a lot of what my mom helped me go through when I was a kid, um, my first book is Finding Your Fit, and it's all about finding your fitness pers personality and meeting yourself where you are and, and taking baby steps. Um, and something is always better than nothing. And all those things came from this experience with my mom when she said, okay, we're going to get you a membership at the YMCA because the demographic is like over 40 and under five. Um, and you're going to feel comfortable moving there because I've always felt more comfortable with people older than me. And she's like, you're going to start walking on the treadmill for 10 minutes. Um, and that's honestly where it started. I started walking for 10 minutes and then 20 minutes. And then I started doing some weight training. And then I started taking some aerobics classes. And then I started teaching aerobics classes. Um, and then eventually it sort of spiraled into being a personal trainer, doing kinesiology in my undergrad, doing a master's degree in exercise science. Like it, it spiraled. But, you know, I really love to encourage my clients to think of it that you don't have to start. Like you don't have to be great to start, but you do have to start to get great. And I think we often get so wrapped up in this walk of shame and this self-talk of, you know, oh, I need to be X. I need to be perfect. Oh, I'm not that. Oh, well, then I might as well, you know, binge eat or sit, you know, sit and watch 12 hours of Netflix or just we create the situations that we are the most afraid of because we are so wrapped up in this idea of if I'm not perfect, I can't start. If I don't have the perfect solution, I can't go, um, you know, so yeah, that that's sort of me. And it's, as I said at the beginning of this whole little explanation, it's why it's helpful for me to sort of do new Kathleen and old Kathleen, although I appreciate it's all one Kathleen, I do find it useful because if I'm sort of sitting and, and wanting to skip my workout, I can think like, no, like I remember how crappy I felt when I used to always skip working out, right? And I remember from years of moving how good I feel when I move. So I can sort of compare you know, when I took path A, how I felt, oh, crappy. And when I take path B, how do I feel? Oh, much better. Um, and then it helps me take to take the path that makes me feel good about myself. Same thing with food, you know. Um, and I think that being able to pause in between stimulus and response, like that stimulus of, oh, I want to skip my workout, you know, like somebody makes me mad or sad or whatever. Um, and you want to make a choice that's not going to serve you and the ability to pause and say like, okay, there's multiple choices that I could make right now. What is going to make the, my future self feel the best? What is going to create that favorite version of me? I think that's such a huge skill. Um, and in a lot of ways, that's what I'm most grateful for, for my journey is just this ability of like, I know all of the different ways I can feel and I want to feel good about myself. Um, and that doesn't mean I'm perfect at all because perfect's not possible, but I don't know. Anyway, does any of that land with you? That's sort of, that's my, that's my story. <laughs> um, beautiful. It's so empowering. And yes, um, I can totally relate to so many things that you just said, and I'm sure my listeners will be able to do so too. So as you know, I'm a personal trainer myself, a fitness yes. expert as well, and a nutrition coach and a yoga teacher, among many other things. And I can so relate to what you said, because I wasn't fit at all as a child so you know I don't I don't know you mentioned that you were using then food to make yourself feel happier and yeah. probably feel the love for yourself a little bit through food I um, was very skinny so I also was mm -hmm. tall and um, I was very skinny and I hated it uh, they, you know mm. there were no beautiful curves and yeah <laughs> anyway I wasn't you know, I wasn't strong. I wasn't fast. I tried to skip any sports classes I could because I, I just wasn't good. And, you know, people who know me now, they think, oh, yeah, you're born like this, you know. And no, I, yeah. I nope. really no, no, to, no, no, no. We created Absolutely it, yeah. not. I have to work yeah. so hard for this. And you'll probably be able to tell I still have to work so hard to keep my muscle mass up. It's just the mm -hmm. way I'm built. And, mm -hmm. you know, my husband, he just does, I don't know, five something and it's like 
bulking out, whereas I'm like really trying and have to keep it up. That's just who I am. But like you said, it's a process. And I love also what you said, you know, always remembering your why. I think this yes. is so powerful instead of falling into this trap of not being good enough and yeah no I possibly can't I mean we all have these thoughts these voices in our head or I think we all do maybe it's yeah I think we do as well yeah <laughs> <laughs> no I think yeah I think it's so easy to get into the comparison game you know and I think especially now with social media but you know listening yes. to your story what's interesting is we have the same story and yet the different story. So you were very thin and really wanted to be strong. Yeah. I was quite overweight and really wanted to be skinny. Yeah. And the both in both cases, we just weren't able to say, this is who I am and how do I make myself my favorite version mm -hmm. of me? We were in this comparison game of if I was X, I would be happy. If I was Y, I would be happy. And I think the, the really true power in life comes from when you can say, I have to thrive in my own lane. I have to take what I was given and I have to make it the best, the most favorite, the strongest, whatever it is for you, whatever means something to you and, and really focus inwards. Um, and I, I, you know, Brené Brown always talks about comparison being the thief of joy, mm -hmm. right? And it's so easy to look on social media or we look at just even our friends and it's easy to compare sort of their done up, their makeup face, right? To our like internal warts. As I'm like, we have all this information um, about ourselves. We, ha we have information about how hard we're struggling. We have information about our moods and we see so little of what everyone else is going through, right? And so little of, of their story and their struggles. Um, and that's, I, that's sort of how it has to be because you know you come into contact with people and you have a sliver into their life, but it's easy because of all the information we have about ourselves to think, okay, it's harder for us. It's harder for me to get out of bed. And Maybe some days it is harder for you to get out of bed and maybe some days it's harder for somebody else to get out of bed. But all of that, I don't know, being human is messy and it's hard and humaning is hard. Um, and the comparison game, right? Like the comparison game is it's not useful and it's not helpful. I mean, yes, be inspired by other people. Yes. You know, I sometimes say to my clients, like imagine like you're driving um, and somebody's in the lane beside you. It's not that you're unaware of them, right? Because you have to make sure that they don't crash into you and you don't crash into them. So I'm not saying ignore all data from the outside world because that is also not possible. Mm. What I'm saying is don't get so like when you're driving your car, don't get so consumed. With, oh my God, their car is red and it's fancier and it's so much more expensive. And if I had that car, I would be happy. And then you crash into their car and you ruin both cars. Like that's the kind of thing we do. Um, if you want to say like, oh, that's so interesting. My friend is really inspired because she wants to play hockey and because she wants to play hockey, she really does strengthening for her ankles and her balance. Oh, that's interesting. She's using like motivation for X to also make herself do Y. That could be interesting for me to do. Like if you want to do that kind of thing where it's helpful and it's productive, go for it. Like you can't just live in a cocoon. But that whole idea of like, oh, well, if I was that person and I would look like that person and, you know, the grass is always going to be greener, as I said, because we know everything about what is going on within ourselves. So I really encourage people to just like listen to both of our stories and see how we both got caught in that. And it was when we sort of said, no, you know, the outside might be some interesting data, but it's definitely not my barometer of success. I'm going to look inwards and I'm going to figure out what works for me. Like that's huge mm. um and i think it's also interesting because i have been the pendulum swing so i've been overweight and desperately wanting to be thin because i thought that would make me happy and then i had a, a time in my 20s where i had disordered eating and i was very very too thin i lost my period and when i was too thin i kept thinking well if i could get thinner i'd be happier and then like and i think it was in both cases when i was overweight or i was too thin both were unhealthy um, and both were driven from an internal dialogue that was just poisonous. I had a roommate in my head that was not useful, that was not productive, that was cruel and mean. Um, and ultimately, it's less about how I look now and much more about I have figured out an internal dialogue that's helpful and productive. And therefore, mm -hmm. I look and feel better. Like mm -hmm. it all is driven from the inside, helping me make choices. You know, and I say to my clients all the time, like, 
self-love that's unconditional, but self-respect that's earned through what you do and the choices that you make. And the more I make choices that I respect, the more I have that sort of wealth of information to be like, oh yeah, when I do X, Y, and Z, I feel really good about myself. When I do, you know, I drink this amount of water, I feel, you know, more energized, but you need to make those choices so that you have that wealth of data. Like, again, I go back to what I said at the beginning is we get this like paralysis analysis kind of idea where we don't do anything. Cause it's like, well, if I don't have the perfect decision, if I don't know the perfect workout, it's like bull crap. Like you might not know the perfect workout, but you know, the least good choice, right? You know, that sitting and doing nothing for 14 hours or 10 hours or six hours, like that's not going to serve you. So instead of, always thinking like, well, I need to have the perfect and then I move. Just think, don't make the worst choice. Do something, have a glass of water, and then use that as data for what you can do next. And the more of these sort of positive choices you make, the better you'll feel. And it will be an upward positive spiral, right? Like I started with 10 minutes of the treadmill. Mm -hmm. If I had said to myself like, well, if I can't do an hour of a walk, it's not even worth it. I would never have left my house. Um, and to be fair, like, that's the kind of stuff I did say for years. I was like, well, if I'm not a great softball player, like, why even try? If I'm not perfect at gym class, I'm just going to pretend to be sick. And it was my mom really saying, like, that stuff, like, we have to, like, it's not serving you. But, okay, so what can we do? What's the smallest thing that we can do that you will actually do? And that was this walk. And, you know, I've now done like 10 marathons, countless half marathons. I've done Ironmans. Like, but it all started you know, with being able to say, okay, it's not going to be the best, but it's definitely better than yesterday. So can we have choices today that are better than yesterday? Then can we have choices next week that are better than this week? Like, can we trend in the right direction? That is what matters. Uh, the most important thing is you just take a step forward today. Like as people are listening to this, I want them to think like, what is one small thing I could do? Can I drink a glass of water? Can I go for a walk? Can I take my kids and play at the park? Like, it doesn't, again, it doesn't have to be like a two hour gym workout to be worthwhile. And it definitely doesn't have to be the perfect week. Like, you know, we were chatting before we got started about this idea, right? Like we were chatting about how we got started, but I have so many clients and I'm sure you do too, that are like, well, this week I can't start because, you know, my nanny has COVID or my kids are sick or I have a cold. So whatever it is, and it's like, I'll start next week. And I think ultimately the truth is, is that Humaning is hard and the week will never be perfect. And there always is going to be crap that is being thrown at you and health, the ability to create a healthy lifestyle requires the skill of saying, it doesn't matter what else is going on. I'm going to find ways and they might not be perfect because perfect doesn't exist. But if I can't go to the gym, okay, I'm going to walk on a conference call, right? Like if I can't go to the gym, I'm going to take my kids to the park. If I, you know, maybe I'm, hanging out with my kids and I get down on the floor and I do some stretching while I'm there, right? Like all of the crap could be going on, but you have to find ways to um, pepper in the movement. And, you know, I often, I like with my clients, this idea of like marrying different activities. So yeah, it'd be great if you could always go to the gym and do your thing and have your alone time and all that stuff. But if you can't do that, okay, so let's marry two activities together, right? Play with your kids, walk on a conference call, you know, park the car a couple blocks away, like whatever it is. Um, but it's a really like find solutions, not excuses attitude. And it doesn't have to be perfect, but it does have to be done. Like those are really the cornerstones of my, of my first book. And it feels so simple um, and it is simple, but it's not easy. Right. And that's the thing about so much of health is it's not actually that complicated, but it's hard to do mm -hmm. because it feels kind of fluffy. It feels like, well, what is one glass of water going to do for me? It's like, well, it's going to do more than doing no zero water, mm -hmm. right? It's going to do better than that, like sugary Coke that you're going to drink. So just replace that, take mm -hmm. that one good choice. Um, and then, you know, James Clear, the author of Atomic Habits, I love that book. And he really talks about each choice that we make being a vote for our future self, right? So if you want your future self to be somebody who drinks a lot of water, guess what? start today. If you want your future self to be somebody who, you know, walks every day, 10,000 steps. Okay. Well, if you're at 2000 steps currently averaging, get it up to 3000 and then get it up to 4,000. And then maybe in a month you'll be at 6,000. Like you have to start like creation, creation, intention and creation. Like that has to be your mantra that you create your fitter future self by starting today and your choices, you know, everything, your health is an aggregate. Like again, to quote James Clear, like he talks about our health being sort of a lagging result of all of the 
choices you've made over the like last 20 years, sort of like your bank account, right? Like you, one choice today doesn't seem like it would make a big difference, but those choices built up over time is how much money you have in your bank account is your health, right? Like those are the things. Um, and it's, yeah, it's just, it's, it's hard, but it's worth it. And it's, and it's really requires just your self-talk. I don't know. Is there a self-talk that you use that's helpful? Uh, first of all, there was so much goodness in what you said, and I, I was about to speak about the self-talk as well because I feel oh, it, it all. <laughs> We're comes, like twins. <laughs> I feel it all comes down to this internal monologue that we have with yes. us all the time. And if this monologue is keeping you little and it's telling you, you know, it's it's way too hard. You've messed up anyway. It's too late now. Um, look at you. Um, you've done it again. You can't even do that. So unhelpful. Oh my exactly. God. Yeah, it's exactly. Not, it's yeah. I like what I like. So I don't have children. So I substitute. Um, oh, I am so sorry. Let me just. Okay. Sorry. That was a, um, I just had a notification, but I've silenced them. Um, um, what was I saying? Oh, so I substitute with my, um, with my clients. I say like, how would you talk to your child? Mm -hmm. So I don't have children, but I substitute like Kathleen, how would you talk to a client? And I find it really helpful because it's easier to be objective with how you would speak to somebody else in the world than how you would speak to yourself. Like it can get very muddled in ourself. Um, and this idea of talking to a child and appreciating that you hold them accountable. So it's not that you say like, oh, well, who cares? Like nothing matters, mm -hmm. but you do it with kindness. Mm -hmm. So um, if your child came home and they had a bad math grade, you wouldn't say like, oh, well, who cares? Well, I don't care if you fail math. But you also wouldn't say you're a loser and you're never going to pass, pass, pass math. Mm. You would say like, are you being hopefully. bullied? Can we? Well, hopefully. Right. But like, are you being bullied? Can we get you a tutor? Are you not getting enough sleep? So this is the thing, because I think when he, people hear like, oh, you need nice self-talk, they think, oh, what that means is just like, oh, yeah, it doesn't matter. Everything you do is perfect. You're perfect. And it's like, No. no right? Everything oh. you do is not perfect, yeah. but that doesn't mean that you are not a good person. Like you can or say- Or that you are a failure. Or that exactly, you must exactly, yeah. exactly, exactly. Yeah. And it's the difference between shame and guilt, right? So yeah. guilt is you did an action you're not proud of. And shame is, well, you're a bad person. It's that identity. It's like, okay, one, you had a cookie and the cookie wasn't great. Okay. So how do I learn from it? That's guilt. And the second one is, oh, you had a cookie. Well, you're destined to be a failure and eat a million different cookies, right? So- yeah. Um, yeah, I think that, and I think that's the trick with self-talk. It's this really delicate balance of holding yourself accountable, but doing it with compassion. I call my group coaching course, kick your ass with compassion. And that's why, because it's like, Beautiful. you have to learn how to like kick your own ass, but do it with a lot of compassion. Um, and it's a, de it's a really delicate balance because people think compassion, oh, that's kind, that's nice, that's easy. And it's like, no, mm -mm. self-care and compassion. Like if you really care about yourself, you make yourself do the hard things. Like I don't always want to go for a workout or go for a walk, but like mm -hmm. I care about myself. And so therefore what I need is not off always what I want, right? It's again, if you go back to having a child, like if the child said, well, I want 700 pounds of chocolate, that's not what, that's not actually kind to the child. So you would say like, no, actually this boundary is, you know, you can have a little bit, you can have a moderate amount. Mm -hmm. um, and that's what we have to learn how to do for ourselves is be our own parent or be our own, nutrition coach right like mm -hmm. again i don't have children but i will say to myself okay kathleen like if you were a client right now like what would you say to the client okay let's say that to yourself mm -hmm. um and i find that that's just easier because it's it's hard to be kind without being nice it's hard to be kind and give yourself what you need versus being like well i want to do this right now so that must be being nice to myself it's like well no that's actually not kind like if you have diabetes be, like sitting on the sofa and eating a bunch of sugar might be what you want, but it's definitely not what you need. And you would not do that for your elderly parent with diabetes or a child or, you know, a nutrition client. So that's what I find is the most helpful is sort of stepping outside yourself and thinking, how would I treat somebody that I love? Because it's amazing how we treat ourselves 
way worse often yeah. than we treat anybody else in our life. Yeah, so true and so sad. And it's so interesting, like most of the clients I work with are moms. And when they were pregnant, they were all able to be really kind to themselves and do what they needed to do to be this best version of themselves because so true. they had the baby in, in themselves. Yes. So and it's crazy. It's, it's so, so interesting. Crazy. Yeah. But it's and then, crazy. And, and then, you know, <laughs> baby comes and they go out, maybe they breastfeed still and can still do that, but then they forget again. And, yeah. you know, I, I, this sounds maybe like I'm perfect. I'm not perfect at all. I will share my self-talk again later as well if, if that's helpful but it's it just seems to me so important to for me that health is really based on the self-love so I feel if we allow ourselves to make healthier choices more self-loving choices then we can you know stack these beautiful things on top of each other and start to feel better one little Absolutely. step at a time yeah. but i love yeah. how you um how you phrased it how you said you know take it a step away and see you know how would you talk to your best friend or yeah, how would you exactly. talk to your child because we wouldn't we wouldn't speak to anyone like we speak no, to ourselves yeah. well and it's just not productive and it's also like I think what you said about that you're not perfect I think that's an important thing to highlight because neither am I and I and the trick for me is to remember that it's not about perfect it's about noticing in the moment when you're doing it mm. we're all going to have those sort of cruel thoughts that come up mm. um, and I'll tell you a story about my group coaching because uh, but it's so easy to get caught up so I had a I'm terrible at technology no I'm getting better I'm working at technology <laughs> that's a better way of putting it and I had a moment where so group coaching there's like between eight and like 20 people online with me and I something went wrong with my technology and I started out laughing like oh my god and I just went down the spiral of being mm. so mean to myself and one of my the coaching clients she put up her hand and I was like yes and she's like Kathleen um would you let us talk to ourselves like that like you're being so mean to yourself and I was like oh my god she's mm. so right so like I've gotten better at the self-talk mm. better with the food and the exercise for sure but what I've been but but mostly what it is, is that I've taught myself that when I say things like, oh, you're not being perfect or this, I'm like, okay, Kathleen, that took you down such a negative health role with your disordered eating. And like, you don't want to go there. That's not kind. That's not healthy. I learned to sort of note it, but I'm still learning to note it with things like technology or and other things. Cause I just don't have as much practice because I'm not in the technology world, but we, the thing for people to listen with everything, with food choices, with nutrition, with uh, exercise choices, with self-talk choices is you're always going to have those sort of knee-jerk reactions of being cruel or knee-jerk reactions of wanting to skip your workout. But the goal is to, like with meditation, it's like the, the image they say in meditation is imagine you're on a swivel chair and when you're meditating this chair swivels, your job is to, to note the swivel before it's like swiveled like four times around the chair. Can you swivel? Can you note it when you're your mind is being lost. Can you note it when it's gone like half an inch and then pull it back? And that's the same thing with this. Can you note the self-critical talk mm. and one minute versus 14 minutes, right? Like instead of doing, like people will go down a self-critical spiral for like hours. So instead, you know, when it comes up in like 30 seconds, can you note it and be like, okay, I get you're trying to help me. I understand that you think that critical talk is going to make me do the right thing, but it's not, this is not productive. So like, how can we talk to ourselves that is productive, but it's, it's a faster noting and then making it softer, like the duration mm, um, and the intensity softer. Uh, but even like if we take in this podcast, right, there's so often when I'm in podcasts and I'll say something that I'm not exactly, you know, I sort of fumble and I go into like, oh my God, like in my mm -hmm. brain, like, oh, you're so stupid. You've done these a million times. Like, why did you say that? And then they're like, okay, wait a second. No, no, no. Pull yourself back in, mm -hmm. right? Because that unhelpful self-talk is not going to make a good podcast. In fact, it just draws you away from the podcast. So let that go. Come back to the moment. It's the same thing with food. It's the same thing with nutrition. Mm -hmm. It's just like, yes, you note the negative talk and you're like, no, it's just not helpful. Pull back to the moment, pull back to the moment. Mm -hmm. um, you know, and I'm not sure if you're going to edit it out or not, but I had that notification came out and I had a moment, notification. It went bing, bing, bing. I had this moment in my head being like, Kathleen, 
You've done 500 billion podcasts. Why didn't you turn your notifications off? And then I was like, no, that's not going to help this podcast. If I go off on a spiral of shame Mm -hmm. next time, just remember to turn your notifications off. Like it's a learning experience. Uh, And I really, really hope that people listening will take this and think, okay, so the next time I aim to work out and I skip a workout, don't go down the shame pathway, go down the learning experience. Like, why did you skip it? Were you angry? Were you tired? Um, Did you not have a healthy enough lunch? So then you were too, you know, wiped to do your workout after work. Um, Did you have too much sugar? So you were kind of too wired to sleep the night before. Mm -hmm. Therefore, you were too tired to wake up and work out. Like, and then how do you work backwards and take that knowledge so that you actually work out next time? If you have a, you know, a three o'clock sugar binge. Okay. So maybe you didn't have enough protein at lunch. So instead of, you know, going crazy and being like, you're a failure, you're never going to be able to eat well, which doesn't help, but also don't say, oh, well, who cares? Say, this is data. How do I learn from it? Mm. Um, and, And that's honestly, if you get one thing from this podcast, it's get rid of that negative self-talk, use a productive self-talk and learn. It's that growth mindset. Like just learn, like we're not perfect. We are people. And as humans, we're not robots. So inherently you're going to have stuff that comes up and can you note the self-talk faster? And can you make the self-talk last less, Mm. like the negative self-talk last less long and just be a little bit softer in intensity. And I think if you can start to do that, then you're winning like that is progress right yes I've been in therapy for 20 years and my negative self-talk still comes out but I catch it faster I'm on that swivel chair I'm like no it doesn't go around three times you know it goes maybe half a swivel chair I catch it and then I just I sort of negotiate with it and I have a little dance with it and I remind myself that it's not it's not helpful beautiful I love that creating this awareness around it and I would just quickly like to share when when this happens to me because mm-hmm. what I'm saying to my children when you know they come home and something didn't work quite out um, I've always been asking them did you try your best and of course yes. I did because we all yes. do we try our best we don't want to mess up we don't want no, not to feel good exactly we are all trying our best so they will always say yes and then then I will say I'm so proud of you. That's all that I'm asking for, that you tried your best. So it's okay, you know. It's okay. And like what you said before, I'm realizing I'm now doing this to myself. So, you know, I... I'm a recovering perfectionist and this will oh, take I know, me so forever. Hard. This will take me my whole life. Forever. It's an yeah. infinite game. It just, yeah, yeah we keep working. Yeah, yeah exactly. Um, but I'm now able to as well as I saw did you give your best? And of course I did it. Did give it my yeah. best shot. And yes, I might have still messed up, but I tried. Yeah. So it's okay. Yeah. yeah. It's, yeah. it's not easy. I'm yeah. not saying that in every situation. No, it's not I'm easy like, at okay, all. Okay, I gave it my best. So oh, I'm cool no, now, but... <laughs> no, no. Uh, so I really then. like, can I, I want to share a concept that I, that I just learned. So I very much like, um, I listen to a lot of Buddhist thought mm. and there's this concept of wise diligence. And I was listening to a podcast. I'll try to find the link for you and send it to you so you can include it in the show notes um, so they get the information from this actual source. But I just loved it. So basically what she says is you have to think about your mind as a garden. And we all have the possibilities of different seeds of happiness and kindness and joy and gratitude. And so much of what comes up in our brain are the seeds that we water. Um, And she says there's four sort of parts to this wise diligence. So first, recognizing which seeds feel good for you and watering those, like intentionally thinking, okay, I love how I feel when I'm grateful. So I'm going to water the seeds of gratitude, like look for things to feel grateful for. Or I love when my body feels sweaty and strong. So I'm going to cultivate opportunities for me to be sweaty and strong. So that's the first part. Then she says, once you have brought these seeds to the surface and you've started to grow them, take the time to keep them around for longer. So have a slightly more intense experience of it. Do you really feel it? The duration is longer um, and more frequent, right? So that's that idea of 
at being like, okay, so I really like to exercise. So I'll do a couple of minutes more, or I'll even just stop exercising, but think about how great it felt when I was moving. Like just really keep those senses of gratitude or of love or whatever it is in your brain. So if you've just, you know, I love, I have a little puppy dog, Olive. And, you know, if we've gone for a nice walk and we've had some nice snuggles, then, you know, I'll think about that for longer than I actually had the snuggles for, because it makes me feel wonderful mm -hmm. so that's the second part is like once you know what serves you what seeds serve you just keep them in your brain and in your heart for longer mm -hmm. then the third is recognizing the seeds that are not as helpful to you right so mm -hmm. I don't know it could be anger or resentment and it's not that those are not going to come up because mm -hmm. again we're human you're going to feel angry you're going to feel resentful and sometimes those are actually useful things to feel um, but they're not useful to stay around so the mm -hmm. fourth part is when you do feel whatever you're feeling that's maybe not as helpful um, then think to yourself okay how do I sort of let them go faster so again with this idea that you're always going to feel things but if you feel resentment and you hold on for it to a week and a half that's different than feeling the resentment and saying like okay interesting why do I feel this can I would it be better to have more helpful to feel some gratitude or should I journal about this? Do I need to talk to somebody about this or right? Like how do I work through this versus versus like holding on to it really yeah. strongly? Um, and I just, I just think it's such a wonderful and compassionate way to think about life because it's not saying anything is good or bad. It's saying that everyone has all of these parts in their garden, right? And we need all of the parts, but it's in what proportions and how do we hold on to them, right? So if you know that you feel good when you drink water, how do you foster environments where you drink more water, right? Uh, not perfect amounts, not like, it's not about perfect. It's just about holding on to the good for longer and letting go of the stuff that doesn't serve you faster. And I, that for me, when I listened to that podcast, again, I'll try to find you the link. I just was like, oh yes, it just feels possible Versus so much of life can just feel like, well, I, you know, self-development can even feel like, well, I got to do this perfectly. Like, it has, I can't think those things. No yeah. negative thoughts. No, no binging. No, no. And it's like, no, no, no. It's not real. It's all there. It's not real. And it's mm. all there. But it's what are you going to water? Mm. I right? love like, that. What do you, you know? So anyway, I, I that honestly, like, I felt like it like changed my life. I'm like, yeah. yes. Yeah, no, it's absolutely beautiful. And what I love about it, that it's so empowering, so yeah. true, so honest, because like you said, it's not true to just, you know, have certain emotions and not the others. And cool. yeah, that, that that is not who we are. Yet we sometimes are told, you know, that you mustn't feel anger or you mustn't feel um, disappointment or sadness. And then... <laughs> we push them away and you know that this doesn't serve us because then they are stuck in us and we are holding on to them and Absolutely. then this whole negative spiral might happen where we then try to soothe ourselves in other ways whatever ways, those ways yeah. look um, so I absolutely love that. That was so beautiful. And yes, oh, please, thank you. please link the podcast. Yes, I'll try to find um, it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I love, um, I, it was an episode of the 10% Happier podcast, which I yeah. really like Dan Harris and he does a lot of like Buddhist thinking and, um, I, yeah, and I, I think you're so right. It's not about not feeling certain emotions. Like my partner, James and I are the phrase that we say to each other. And I say this to my coaching clients as well, is that all emotions are okay. All actions are not. And I think the problem is that we link yeah. emotion and action. Yeah. So we think like, oh, well, if I'm angry or I'm frustrated, well, then obviously like I quote have to eat because I am feeling these ways, or if I'm angry, I have to yell, or if I'm, you know, and when you can just step away and be like, I can feel anything that I'm going to feel because feelings, you know, you can't decide how you're going to feel. It's just how you yeah. feel, but then I can take the action that's going to serve me. So yeah. I can be unbelievably angry and not punch somebody in the face. I can be angry and say, you know what? I'm not going to send that email for 24 hours because I'm going to let myself calm down. Or I can say like, yeah, I'm really sad, but instead of eating 75 cookies, I'm going to go for a walk and phone a friend or listen to a podcast or so feel however you're going to feel. Because again, human, messy, complicated, like, right? We are our messy, complicated emotions. Feel it, own it, but then say, now what is the action that will serve me? Like, how do I create my favorite version of myself? Oh, the favorite version of myself? 
would go for a walk, you know, and phone my best friend and just say, I'm so upset about this. And then your best friend would say, I totally get it. And then you'd work through the emotion mm -hmm. and then you'd feel okay, mm -hmm. right? Or you'd have a bath and, you know, put on some nice music or candles or whatever is going to make you feel good, good in your body. And only you know what that is for you. Beautiful. I love it. And I could chat with you forever. I know, I feel it totally. You are way. absolutely amazing. I think we have to definitely have another chat because yes, I feel please, please, there's please. so much more that you have to say and give us. Um, but I would love for you to tell us where can we find you? Where can we find your amazing book and your amazing programs? Are you doing yeah. them online as well? Yeah, you said so. Yeah, so yeah. I do. Um, my group coaching is a five-week group coaching program and I normally offer it about twice a year so I'm doing one right now we're almost mm -hmm. done I'll probably do another one maybe March I don't know we'll see um, I normally do one like information for that and my website is kathleentrotter.com right. and, and my website all has all my information have, yeah perfect yeah and it has the reviews uh, like I do book reviews of like you know James Clear and Brené Brown and Carol Dweck like all the books that have really influenced me mm -hmm. I do Beautiful. sort of synopsis of the books um you can also buy my two books Finding Your Fit is my first one and Your Fit is Future Self is my second one awesome. um, and then I'm fit by Kathleen T on all the socials like Instagram and Facebook and all that stuff so I have like Monday moves so I do a different exercise um, every Monday I do a fitness Friday back. Like, so yeah, I'm around. And if you contact me and reach out and message me, I will absolutely get back to you. I love talking about, you know, different fitness conundrums. So, you know, you can say, I don't know what I need to do about X or Y and I will definitely help out. Mm, and you definitely love empower, empowering others. That's all very clear. I, do. I would love for you to share three golden nuggets with my audience. I mean, you have shared so many golden nuggets in this interview already, but now to just sum it up maybe to three golden or well, very short golden. Short, yeah. Yeah, so I mean, I, I often call them Kathleenisms, like things that I just say all the time. The first one would be the worse your mood, the more important your workout. Mm -hmm. um, I think it's That's really easy one. to <laughs> right so to funny. work out when you feel good. It's like, oh, yeah. I feel really motivated. So today's the day I'll work out. And it's actually the opposite. It's like on the days that you feel low, a little bit depressed, a little bit anxious, like whatever, those are the days that are important to say, like, I will feel so much better if I move. Um, and it's almost the days where you feel the best that I'm happy with you skipping your workout. Like, I mean, I'd rather you work out, but if you're going to skip any day, skip the days you already feel good because you don't need that hit of, you know, strength and empowerment. And, you know, so that would be the one thing. Can I just um, share? Um, yeah, I love that's it. It's just such a perfect fit. So my husband will say to me when I'm in a really bad mood, he'll say like, oh, uh, don't you want to go for a run or don't you want to go <laughs> on your yoga mat? That to me too, totally. If we're like in a, if we're in a fight or whatever, often what we'll do is actually just be like, let's like, let me go for a walk. Let me do a workout. And yeah. then I come back and like, I have an entirely different perspective yeah. about the, enti yeah. about the experience, you know, yeah. it really does change your physiological state. Yeah. Um, and um, Tony Robbins has this like, concept of a uh, state story strategy so um, they change your physiological state yeah. by meditating, working out, uh, listening just to music, w because as soon as your physiological state changes, your story about your life changes, and then yeah. you can create a better strategy. So maybe that would be my second nugget of just this Amazing. idea of Amazing. change your state always, no matter if you are feeling angry, frustrated, resentful, any of that stuff, before you make a decision, take a pause and do something, dance around your living room, pet a dog, mm. right? Go to the dog park, hang out with some cute puppies, go for a walk, get some fresh air, change your physiological state. And it will change how your brain is mm. thinking about the experience mm. and then create a strategy. Because too often we create the strategy when we're in a poor physiological state, right? So you're feeling upset yes. about something. Yes. And then you're like, well, my strategy is to have a bucket of ice cream. It's like, no, no, no. That strategy is based on a poor story. And then, you know, so and that would definitely be even worse than idea. after. Exactly. It's, and yeah. then you feel even worse. Exactly. Yeah. So yeah. So first one, worse your mood, the more important the workout. Second one, state story strategy. Mm -hmm. um, and I think the third thing is just have a mantra that you can repeat to yourself, you know, and it could be your why. For me, it's I can do hard things because often life, like, listen, life is, can be really overwhelming and exhausting and, you know, humaning, as I keep saying, it, it's really hard, it's messy and, and, you know, it's easy to feel overwhelmed. And so I just always say to myself, like, Kathy, you can do hard things. Like, it doesn't mean you should have to do it, right? Like, I'm not arguing that it's 
you know, fair, but fair doesn't matter, right? Like it, it happened regardless. And so you need something that you can say to yourself when you're in the midst of feeling like it's too much and it's unfair, you know? So it could be, you know, think of solutions, not excuses. That's another one I use. It could be, you know, whatever your why is like, I'm doing this to be, you know, strong for my family. Um, I, I don't, I don't know what your mantra would be, but find something that's meaningful for you. And when you're in that overwhelmed state step away from it for a second and just remind yourself of who you are and you're strong and you're competent and you know all of the data from your life shows that you are a survivor like you have gotten through everything that has been thrown at you for however long if you've been on this earth for 40 years you know i'm 40 i've gotten through a lot i've, I've done a lot and 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 i've lived and you know, I maybe shouldn't I, should I have had to? Probably not. Like, is it fair? Absolutely not. But it had, but it was my life. And, you know, so I learned and I, and it showed me that I can do hard things. So I say that to myself all the time. I'm like, I can do hard things, Kathleen. Do it. Just, just do the thing. Beautiful. Thank you so much, Kathleen. This has been amazing. You oh, my are amazing. Pleasure. I am such a huge fan of you and thank you so much for helping me to make this world a healthier, happier place. I'm incredibly grateful for all that you do and for the amazing you that you are. Thank you. Wow. I am very grateful that I got to come and hang out. It's Sunday morning for me. So this just like started my day off with a wonderful bang. So thank you very much. Mm, take care, beautiful. Speak soon. I really hope you loved and enjoyed this episode as much as I did. And if you did, I have a favor to ask. Could you please like, subscribe, share and review this podcast because this would help to make our world a healthier, happier place by spreading and sharing this knowledge everywhere. I know that you were born to live your best life, to feel absolutely wonderful in your precious body, in your brilliant mind and in your boundless soul. So please make sure you do. What are you waiting for? I believe in you. I'm your biggest cheerleader. Keep glowing. Much love.